Welcome to the Hot Springs Village Audubon Society first virtual meeting ever. We're really going to try to work without a soundtrack because I need feedback from the audience and we're in a small room here and hope that you guys can benefit from this endeavor. We're going to do better next month. First of all, I want to introduce our video our uh, videographer, is that what you are? Mm -hmm. I'll call him a videographer. Larry Wilson with Lifelong Learning Center has done our videos last month and this month and hopefully going forward. I'm Norma Wall and I'll be chairing your meeting for you today. On the financials, oh, the bird seed sales. We'll have Harry talk to you about the bird seed sales. But financially, we're sound but not gaining any ground. We're not losing ground very much, but we're not gaining ground. Uh, we do have membership dues coming up for the next couple of months, and this year we are offering you a, anyone, to anyone who needs it, I don't know if you can see this or not, but to anyone who needs it, we're offering a membership card. And the membership card is good for discounts that we'll let you know about. It's, some, it's something to do with the park service. So anyway, we'll, we'll give everyone a membership card who wants one. So that's coming up and our dues have not gone up and we're going to try to do everything we can to have as many activities and meetings as possible given the circumstance. We have a new program coming up that Kathleen Ball will be chairing. It's the village cleanup effort. We'll do that the first quarter. We won't do it this time. They're doing one, uh, the POA is doing one this month or so, but we will start ours in the first quarter. I'm getting with Kathleen within the next couple of weeks and she'll put her program together and we will of course need volunteers. Volunteers, everybody volunteer. Vic Krislipski Prisl normally does our bird announcements and so forth but he's out of town right now so I'm just going to tell you what's been going on on the website. As of this month, for the month of September I should say, the month of September, we had 651 unique visitors. That means from different computers across, across the world. One of the things that we do frequently get is requirements, I mean, uh, people from New York and other states asking about birdhouses and if they can get one of our wonderful birdhouses. And of course, I invite them to come to the village and we'll be more than happy to accommodate them. But out of the 651 unique visitors, we had 23,000 impressions. That's a click. Pre impressions. 23,000 impressions in a month. And of that, the number one search was for hummingbirds. We had 46 searches specifically for hummingbirds. And of that, we had 521 clicks for hummingbirds. You're all seeing the hummingbirds are waxing and waning right now. They're still doing crazy dances. They're still bulking up to get ready for their trip south. So keep your hummingbird feeders clean and full. It will not keep them from making their trip south. Don't worry about it. Just keep those feeders up, keep them clean, keep them full. The hummers will do everything else. Christmas bird count. I'm gonna ask Chris Cash to step in and talk to us about Christmas bird count. Good morning. Well, at the last meeting I said that we were going to start sign-ups for Christmas bird count this meeting because there was no guidance from National Audubon about Christmas bird count. Well, the guidance has come out and they say we have to wait until at least November 15th to sign up to see how COVID is working in our region. So we still plan at this point to have Christmas bird count on Monday, December 14th but it has to be a safe and socially distanced Christmas bird count. There will be no dinner, no in-person compilation at all this year. If we do go out in the field, and once again, Audubon will help us make that decision in November now, we have to be socially masked and socially distanced the whole time. We can only carpool in family groups or what National Audubon called a social pod group, which I think means if you're having dinner and driving with, say if I were with Norma going birding and driving with her, then we could be in one car. Otherwise, it has to be separate cars 
So we will keep the groups probably to five people at the most. And then we have to comply with all local and municipal guidelines. They do assure us, however, that there is little or no impact on the scientific value of Christmas bird count in our region by missing one season. So I'm going to have to wait till next meeting to tell you whether we're having an in-person bird count. But whether we have the in-person or not, we will do backyard bird count that day. So I will put up those sign-up sheets also in November for Christmas bird count. If you have any questions, you can ask them through our fabulous website or call me directly or get hold of me somehow and I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Chris. Now we're going to have Harry tell us about what's going on with our bird seed sale and then I'll comment about that afterward. Hi, folks. Well, yes, the uh, fall bird seed sale is coming to an end. But the good news is you still have till Saturday, October the 10th, to get your orders in. And once again, we have selected five of the most popular uh, bird seeds for to satisfy the needs of our birds in this area. Uh, they are the freshest and highest quality bird seed you can find anywhere. Uh, we purchase our uh, seeds through Wild Birds Unlimited out of Little Rock, and we certainly appreciate their agreement with us. Uh, orders are processed through them, and our shipment is sent directly from the mills, so it is the freshest and most affordable seed that you can find. So we'd like to thank them for, for their cooperation in that. Uh, the four seeds, or actually five seeds that we have selected is a black oil sunflower, a supreme blend, which is a no millet uh, sunflower, uh, no mess, no millet, and a real popular sunflower hearts. Uh, this is probably the no waste uh, type seed that you will find. And then we offer a, a thistle seed. The uh, four seeds I mentioned earlier all come uh, in either a 10 pound or a 20 pound bag. And uh, this bag features an easy care handle in both the 10 and 20 pound size. And a real nice feature is a resealable uh, Ziploc. So it keeps your unused uh, seeds very fresh. So, um, why are, why are bird seeds the best? It tells you right on the, on the uh, bag itself, our seed and seed blends are chosen by local experts. Our seed blends contain no cereal fillers, and our seed blends are exclusively formulated with only the highest quality seeds to be best for your birds. So, you have time, don't let this happen. <laughs> An empty bag. Uh, we have a great fall season and winter season coming up and the birds are really dependent on us to provide them the three things that they really need to survive and that's food, water, and shelter. And you will get the best food for them out of this um, bird seed sale. As I said, you, the sale closes on Saturday, October the 10th. You can go online right now and uh, pull up this order form, fill it out. Yes, we do take charge cards. Or you can print out a copy of this and mail it to us. Uh, the seed pickup will be on October the 23rd and 24th. That is Friday, October the 23rd and the pickup time is between 4 and 6 p.m. and Saturday pickup time is between 9 and 12 noon. And uh, when you enter your order it gives you full instructions on where the location for the pickup is and uh, we will be uh, most grateful for your continued support. We have received uh, 
quite a number of orders, um, but we certainly have not met our goal for the fall birdseed sales. We're running a little behind last year, so I encourage you to, to go online, pick out the seeds you need, and let's get ready for a, a very successful bird winter. And um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Norm. Thank you very much for your continued support. And let me add that the profits from our seed sale help support programs such as you're going to see today covering Arkansas bats. Uh, and we also use the profits to uh, help support scholarships uh, for our youth that attends the uh, Hallbury Ecology Camp. So the monies are, are well spent and uh, support activities right here in the village. So thank you again for your support and we look forward to a great one. Thank you, Harry. Now at this point, we're going to have the applause. Yay! <laughs> Don't forget, if you want to go online, to do your ordering for the bird seed, it's hsvbirds.org. If you can't find that, just Google Audubon Hot Springs Village and it'll pop right up. We'd be more than delighted to have any kind of support that you're willing to give us. That's one of the things that uh, makes this, this uh, so great is that all of our membership is very involved on a regular basis with this kind of support. So thank you in advance for that. By the way, we did get a good flurry of orders after we reminded you guys the other day that it was coming to an end, so thumbs up. Still time. Okay, I want to introduce today our speaker, Philip Jordan. Philip is a wildlife biologist specializing in the study of bats. Uh, Philip is with the Southern University Station, a branch of the, branch of the USDA Forest Service at Hot Springs. His interest is in wildlife altogether, but for the bat, pal, I almost said bats, but for the past 14 years he's been focusing on the study of bats. He earned a BS in Wildlife Ecology and Management in 2010 and an MS in Biology in 2014 from Arkansas State University at Jonesboro. One thing that I really appreciate here is that his thesis focused on bat deaths and interaction with wind turbines in Arkansas. And we have a question for him with that at the end of, the, of his speech, of, of his program. And then also, if you guys have questions, send them to me through the website, hsvbirds.org. Just go in there and make any comment and they'll come through to me and I'll try to get them answered by Philip before the end of the program. Philip. Thank, Thank you. You. you can take your mask off. Thanks guys. Uh, like Norma said, my name is Philip Jordan and I am a wildlife biologist and I've been studying bats for quite some time. Um, the title says Bats of Arkansas, but we are going to look at other things uh, like white nose syndrome and attracting bats to your property and bat houses. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey. Awesome, thank you. So before we get into talking about the bats of Arkansas, I want to give a little bit of general information about bats. So they're under the order Chiroptera, which literally means hand wing. So if you do this, this is a bat's wing. Um, there's two suborders under the order Chiroptera, the Mega Chiropterans, which are our big bats, mega big. Um, they're found in the old world, Africa, Asia, um, Australia, and covers the flying foxes, hammerhead bats, and our really big sized bats. And then we have our microchiropterans, micro small. Uh, and these guys are found in the new world. They're found in Africa as well. But all of our bats over here in North America, South America, um, they're all microchiropterans. Talk about bat diversity a bit. Um, bats are known to be at least 57 million years old, and this is the first first bat fossil ever found. It's found in Wyoming. There's 
over a thousand species of bats worldwide. Now this is only second to the rodents in the number of species in a particular order for mammals. Um, there's 47 species in the United States. All of them are insectivorous except one in southeast, southwest California, and it is a nectar bat. And we have 16 species here in Arkansas. We believe we have 16 species, but one is thought to be extirpated from the state. So we have 15 to 16 species of bats. And the reason we think that it's extirpated from the state is because of white nose. And we'll get into that here in a bit. So some bats use echolocation. The bats that we have here in the United States, they're all echolocators. Um, some bats use their vision for, to see their food. Some bat use their nose to find their food. So there's a different way of finding their food items. So some bats have a really small wingspan like this kitty hognose bat, or they call it a bumblebee bat. It can have a wingspan of about five inches, about the size of my hand. And then we have some of these guys that have a wingspan like this. Five and a half feet wingspan, that's the flying fox. We have some bats that are really cute, like this tent making bat. Uh, that, I took this picture in Nicaragua. And then you have some bats that aren't all that pretty. Uh, this guy is a wrinkled faced bat. He's found in Central South America. And the thought about these wrinkles is uh, they're a fruit eater, so they plunge their face into a piece of fruit and they have all these juices going everywhere. And the thought is that the juices channel in and eventually wow. makes it to his mouth. So that's the hypothesis behind those wrinkles. And some ears on our bats are like mouse ears, they're pretty small. And then some ears are really big, like this, bigger bat. So we see bat diversity is abundant. It, it's really changing and uh, it's worldwide. So now let's focus on the bats of Arkansas. Like I said earlier, they're insectivorous, all of them eat insects. And this plays well for United States agricultural industry. $23 billion in savings our agricultural industry sees from bats eating insects. And this is illustrated really well by 150 brown bats eating 1.3 million pest insects per year. Now, if we extrapolate that out into the entire big brown bat population, that's billions of pest insects every year. We need bats. We have to have them. So when we look at grouping our bats, we like to do it in how they sleep, how they sleep during the winter time, how they sleep during the summertime. So some bats will hibernate in caves and they will roost in caves. Some bats will hibernate in the forest and they will roost in the forest. Some bats have a mixture. They stay in the caves during the winter come out in the forest during the summer. And then some just say, forget it, we're just going to that house. Yeah. So <laughs> they have a totally different strategy on how they hibernate and roost. And I threw this line in here about hibernation uh, just to show how extreme bat hibernation is. They can drop their body, their body heat down to about freezing, so blood that's almost <laughs> so wow. the whole body is almost freezing take one bat per 15 or one breath i'm sorry per 15 minutes so real shallow breathing and 20 heartbeats per minute now that's out of a normal 200 but when they're out feeding it can get up to 900 to a thousand beats per minute so we can see just by that line how extreme bat hibernation is. And we'll go into that. Oh. 
So looking at our cave bats, there are two bat species that are obligated, meaning their entire life they spend in caves. They roost and hibernate in caves. And our first one that we're going to look at is the Ozark Big Eared Bat. It's a highly endangered species, only known from five counties in, in the United States, um, two in Arkansas and three in Oklahoma, and they specialize on moths. Now, does this picture look familiar, guys? There he is. Uh, the, yeah, that's my picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super proud of this picture because I was hanging off a cave wall like this and, it, and I'm really proud of that picture and it got put on this book. Um, and this is the range, like I said, five counties in, or in this area to where they can be found. So it's an extremely small population. And then we have our gray bat. It's also endangered, but there's way more in the population. Um, there was the we were looking at taking it off the endangered species list because it's that big of a success story. But with white nose, we decided against that. Um, and the cool fact about these guys, 95% of their population can be found in 11 caves. So over 2 million bats spread out between 11 caves. Wow. This is Great bat. It's pretty nondescript, but um, really neat species. And this is where those 11 caves are. So it's, they're regulated to limestone caves, and this is an area of the United States to where limestone caves can be found. So looking at our forest bats, um, start with the eastern red bat. Now these guys are really neat because they have a furry tail. The others, most of our species don't have fur on their tail except the first three. So they cover, their tail is covered with fur and during the winter time they'll go out to the woods and they'll land on the forest floor, they'll crawl up under some leaves, they'll curl that tail, they'll put their head under that tail and they'll stay in the little warm box until it gets warm enough to where they can get up and fly again. So bats aren't only found in caves, sometimes they can be found on the forest floor. So, and this picture I used, this is not my picture, uh, it's a super great picture just to show how blended that they can be in their environment. This is the bat right here and you see all these leaves back behind it, just blends in really well. So. Seminole bat, it uses the same winter strategy. Um, it has fur on its tail. Um, it's closely related to the red bat, but the fur is a different color. So it's got a deep, what we like to call a mahogany fur on it. And this is a good picture too. We have a worry bat, which is the largest bat in the United States. Um, and they're really colorful, they're big bodied, they're just a really neat bat. Um, and the neat little fact about these guys is that they go, they take really long distance migrations. They'll, they start in the northwest part of the country, in the Pacific Northwest, and they cut a diagonal across the United States through our area and down into Central America. And the silver hair bat, it, sometimes it can be found in houses, but for the most part, it is a forest bat, and they also do the same type of long distance migration from northwest to southeast. And this is the silver hair bat. You can't really see it on this picture, but on their backs, they actually do have silver hair. So, really neat species as well. Excuse me. Um, and then our swamp bats, the bats that like our bottomland hardwood forest, the, the, the low-lying areas of the state. Um, so we have our raft nest bigger bat. They like to roost and hibernate in hollow gum trees and cypress trees, and they'll form these pretty good-sized colonies. Um, but they are 
a big beard bat as well. I have these really huge, over-exaggerated ears. Um, and when they feel threatened or when they're roosting, or they'll curl those ears and it makes them kind of look like a ram's head. So you see the ears curled up right here. It's just a really neat species. And then southeastern bat, my oldest, uh, it also roosts and hibernates in large hollow trees. And this is the species. Oh. He's enjoying his little head getting petted. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Amazing. So now the species that use a combination of cave hibernation and forest roosting. Uh, these three bats, they're, so the Indiana bat and the Northern Long-Eared bat, they both have federal protection. The Northern Long-Eared bat's a threatened species. The Indiana bat is a endangered species and the little brown bat is being petitioned to be put on the endangered species list. So the last two are due to white nose syndrome and the Indiana bat was endangered way before white nose hit. Uh, so the Indiana bat hibernates in caves and it uh, spends its summers out in the woods. The females will migrate north, form maternity colonies, and the males will pretty much stay around their hibernation cave. And these guys, they're really cute. They're like just a big gray little soft fur poof ball. I really enjoy, <laughs> I really enjoy handling these guys and they're endangered, so, so you get to handle endangered species and a cute one. Uh, the Northern Long-Eared Bat, um, it has the same type of strategy. Um, winter in caves, goes out for maternity colonies in the summer. This is a northern long-eared bat. And I need to say for the people out there on the internet, these pictures were taken before the rubber gloves were required. So um, now we had to wear vinyl gloves to handle bats. And the little brown bat, it also migrates. Uh, north to south, hibernates in caves, and stays in trees and houses during the winter. And that's him. Now these last five species, they're pretty much found anywhere. They roost, hibernate, pretty much anywhere they can find. The tricolor bat, that's another bat that's been petitioned for endangered status uh, due to white nose syndrome. They've been hit really hard by white nose. They don't form colonies, um, and most of the time you'll find a single bat hanging. Uh, like you've been on the cave tours in Blanchard Springs and you see a bat hanging here and there, more than likely it's a tricolored bat. And we can see these, tell what these guys are by their pink forearms. Uh, evening bats, they're another bat that likes to just go everywhere and roost everywhere. Um, these guys have two nodules on their nose and their their wings, their ears, they're just super jet black, so they're fairly easy to identify as well. Big brown bat, like I said, it's human structures, mines, caves, trees, pretty much everywhere. This is a building in the middle of nowhere uh, that I found these guys in. Small footed bat. Uh, cave, rock hibernation, rock roosting. I was talking to Norma earlier about we have a grad student doing work on small footed bats and she's been going into these rocky outcrops, really steep slopes, and she found a bunch at Mount Nebo, Mount Magazine, and just in these little cracks. Uh, really neat bat. And these guys are fairly easy to identify because they have a black mask. So, it, like a raccoon bat. So, like a Batman mask. Yeah, right. So, and our Brazilian free tail bats. Mm -hmm. um, neat little fact about these guys they have the largest maternity colony in the world. 
and that's at Bracken Cave in Texas, the same bass that we were talking about earlier in Austin flying out the bridge, that's Brazilian Frito bass. And so now we get to the serious part of the conversation and we'll talk about white nose syndrome. It's caused by a fungus that wakes the bats up while they're hibernating. Bats go into hibernation with a very limited amount of energy, body fat, that they can tap into throughout hibernation. Well, this fungus is getting in their skin and it's causing irritation and itching so the bats get up to fly to get away from it. Well, while they're flying, they use up all their reserves and there's no insects for them to replenish their reserves. So they starve to death, they dehydrate. It's really tragic what's going on. Started in New York in 2006. Let's see if this shows up well. Well, no, right here. And since 2006, it has affected 33 states seven Canadian provinces in Arkansas, 15 counties are positive for white nose. And then we have a handful of other counties that are suspect of white nose, including Garland. So um, it only affects hibernating bats. It's caused over 7 million bat deaths since 2006. And we've seen large habanaculas that have tens of thousands of bats come out with zero. So near 100% mortality in some of these really large populations. And it's caused three species to be petitioned for threatened or endangered status. I went back and forth on whether I was gonna do this next section or not, but I went ahead to say, yeah, I feel that everybody needs to see this. People need to see the destruction that white nose is causing so they won't continue to spread the disease or they'll help in future with these. So I dove on the internet looking for just some pretty bad white nose pictures and I found some. These bats are stuck to ice. Oh. All these are bats on the cave floor. This picture right here, we see all these dead bats over here, but if a carnivore is lucky enough to stumble upon it, well, they'll just clean off the bones. Ball is just walking up to trees, just littered with dead bats. Another bat stuck to the icicle. And then again, cave floors just littered with dead bats. And all these bats starved because there's no food to, for them to get. So I only have a couple of pictures from Arkansas of white nose syndrome. Uh, I don't do a lot of work in the north part of the state, which is where it's really um, spread. But the two times I did go up to help the guys up north, I got these pictures. So this tricolored bat, its face this way was covered in white nose and the eye had been taken out. I don't know if the bat scratched so hard or whatever happened, but it didn't have an eye. And this poor fella, it's it's another tricolored bat and its mouth was completely like welded glued shut because of this so i don't know if these two bats survived i don't I, i'm betting they probably didn't crossing our fingers they did so but what can we do about white nose the public we really can't do anything we we're not you guys aren't scientists y'all don't have the 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 instruments to do this type of work. We have plenty of good scientists working to find a cure. But what do we do in the meantime? Well, we can educate ourselves. I can come to these presentations. I can show you these bad pictures and I can educate you guys. 
Well, you guys take this information and share it. You can educate other people. This website right here, whitenosyndrome.org, is a really good resource to, what, to, to see what we can do and how we can help out. Um, report odd bat behavior. If you guys are out hiking during the winter time and you pass by a cave entrance, you pass by a mine entrance, you see these bats flying, that's not normal behavior. They should be inside asleep. Let a wildlife biologist, let a professional, somebody know about it. Do not disturb hibernating bats. So the gray bat I showed you earlier in 11 caves, the reason that bat is in danger is because people would go in and disturb these hundreds of thousands of bats, causing them to get up and use their fat reserves. Well, that caused a drop in the population. Well, now we have a lot of these caves protected and so the population is starting to go back up. So that's a really good success story on uh, not disturbing hibernating bats. You don't need to go in the cave during the winter time if it can wait till summer, fall, wait till summer and fall. Um, if you have to go into a cave, know how to decontaminate your gear. And that's a big problem. The, the spores of this fungus is super sticky, so you go into a, a white nose cave and get the fungus on you, you can take it to another cave that's not infected and you just infected that cave. So just make sure that you decontaminate your gear and you can go to that website to find proper decontamination protocols. And that and this next bullet is pretty much the same thing. If you don't, if you have gear in a white nose county, you do not take it to a white nose county or a white nose state. Um, help the bats that we have. And how do we help our bats? Well, one way we can bring it to our property. Um, so if you have a dead tree, that's what snags are, it's a dead standing tree. If you have a dead tree in your yard that you can leave safely without injuring somebody, leave it alone. That dead tree can provide habitat for bats and many other species of wildlife. So if you can leave it safely, leave it alone. Avoid using pesticides. We have natural pesticides, it's called bats. So <laughs> we let our bats get our insects, right? So um, let's keep our cats inside. Study in the United Kingdom, small area, about 250,000 bats per year die because of cats. We can keep Garfield inside, let's do it. <laughs> and we can install bat houses. So the next topic is bat houses. Okay. I get a lot of questions about bat houses, so I felt it was we need to talk about it. So there's two types of bat houses. Now I'm gonna show you plans for bat houses in this website, batcon.org, BCI, that's this group. Um, they have pretty much these next few slides came from uh, batcon.org. So, uh, a rocket box. Now it's just this sh square I've seen on uh, circular as well. Has chambers inside and it's just a really nice um, home for bats. And then we have these traditional style houses. It's what we normally see. It's what most people build for bat houses. This is those. All right, so what's recommended for bat houses? Now, I have recommended in quotations because if you can't get, if you can't put your bat house up right next to a pond, a lake, a stream, it's not gonna keep bats from coming to your property. You, you still put it up. That's what BCI says on their website. If you can't get all these, don't worry about it. Bats will still use it. If you can't find a south facing area on your property to give it maximum solar exposure, that's fine. Find somewhere that's east or west. Um, bat houses can be mounted on poles be mounted on houses. So let's say that 
bats were getting in this house up near that bend up there. The homeowners could have came in after the bats flew out for the night, restricted that area, and then put the bat house up. So instead of looking for that one area that they've been going to, maybe they'll transfer from that area to your bat house. So that's a good idea. Say you have a bunch of bats in a barn and you want them out of the barn. Maybe you put bat houses up on, on the outside of your barn and then restrict the ways that they were getting in. So those are a few ways that we can help out bats. One of the more important things that we need to remember about bat houses is to rough up the surface of the boards. Okay. Some, some people will put them in there and just have a slick backside. Well, it's, the bats can't grip a hold to that. So if you rough up that surface, they'll have something to grip a hold to and they'll more than they'll be more apt to use it then. So with that, I have any questions. Actually you do have some questions. But I like I went pretty fast. Yeah you went pretty fast. We can what we're gonna do Philip is we'll put we'll put a lot of your information up on our website so that everyone can see it and have time to write down what they need to regard. I think one of the big questions, of course, is with regard to the white nose that Janelle Harris asked that question early on, one of our members. And uh, in addition to what you've gone over here, is there, is there anything else that we should know about the spread or the, uh, the, the short term and the long term projection of what's going to be happening? Oh, uh, projection? I don't know looking forward um i can just say that it's killing them right now and if we can avoid caves if we can let people know when we see weird stuff that can help out um but as far as looking forward i don't know right now i think we're kind of stuck on where we are okay so well, we had a lot of uh, a lot of questions with regard to bat structures, and you've covered that well here. We again, we'll put this information on our website so people can pull the information down. Now, the last time you were here was two years ago, mm -hmm. and we had a member from the carp not carpenter, what is it? The people that woodworkers club were that asked about building bat houses. Mm -hmm. So, for the for the applications that you can see around this area. Is there one in particular that you think would be more appropriate for this area than others? By this area, I mean the village itself and the, the homes here. No, I don't think that one is better than the other. A okay. rocket box, I don't think is any more better than the traditional bat houses. I, I don't know 100% okay. on whether the rocket box is better than this, but the main point of like BCI is to put them up. It is to to put them up and to be patient. You might not have a bat that next night. You might not have a bat that next month. But maybe next year, the year after, you might have a bat. You might have a, a colony of bats. Who mm -hmm. knows? Just don't give up on it. Okay. That, that's one of the biggest okay. points. And all of the specifications are on this particular yes, there, there's so we'll, full, we there, will put those on the website. I only so screenshotted the first them. of the plans. So there's full plans on that website. Okay. Yes. Do you have a question? So we talked earlier about <clears throat> placement in South. You can't roast bats in a bat house, correct? No, they're not going to get too high. Because that's and if they said. do, that's fine. They leave? They'll move. Okay. Uh, I mean, bats are bats are pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> if they get too hot, they're going to move. If they're too cold, they're gonna find somewhere to warm up. And so that's on that whole maximum exposure. What if they already had a maximum exposure site and you can only get maybe the east facing on yours. So maybe they'll use your bat house to get away from the extreme heat on their normal roost. That's a thought, maybe. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. And 
Harry? It is white nose syndrome uh, limited to just bats or is it It spread? is limited to just bats. It don't affect humans in any way and it's only affecting arcade bats. So the forest bats, the, the red bats, the hoary bat, the Seminole bat, they're not being affected by white nose. Um, and even our, like the gray bat, it's a bigger body bat. They're not dying at a rate like let's say the tricolor bat it's a smaller body bat so they're dropping like flies and same with uh, the northern long eared bat they're just getting completely wiped mm. out used to be one of the most popular bats we catch in the ozarks now they think last year they caught three wow. so yeah it, it's pretty dramatic when you ask when you speak of hibernation what months here in Arkansas do we expect the bats to be in hibernation? And do they hibernate like a bear does, like long term in the same they, spot normally? Same spot normally. Um, long term, yes, uh, they do get up to go get a drink of water and to use the bathroom. Huh, sort of like people. Sort of like people. So if you're down too long, you're going to need to go. So they'll, they'll pop up, they'll go get a drink, they'll use the bathroom, and then they'll come right back. Okay. And, and yeah. So. Okay, very interesting. Well, one of the questions, of course, that keeps coming up is re regarding the, the, the structures for them. But also we had uh, someone ask, how do you keep them out of your house, out of your attic, other than the obvious you have to cover, find the, them. cover the holes? You have to find where they're getting in, okay. and the, and if you find where they're getting in, wait or wait till dusk. Go outside your house and start watching for where they're coming out. Go to that area, find where they're coming out, and then you'll have to put some chicken wire or something up over that area to keep them from coming in. Okay. But if they found the area to get in, there's they're going to keep using it. Yeah, well, they'll until probably, you restrict it, the squirrels will probably use it too. So you, no. you're in trouble. You're just in trouble. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. What? Are, do we have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What is being done to uh, mitigate the white nose syndrome? I mean, if they're discovered, is there anything that can be done to help the bats? We're just letting it play out. That's basically all we can do without catching every single one of those in that colony because the white nose hits colonies really hard because it's like a so say you have a piece of bread and you see your um mold so oh. it's just like that it'll start in this one spot but by the time it's over it'll have spread to the entire piece and that's what this fungus does it, so you have one back there in the center at the beginning of winter by the end of winter that whole area around that bat can be affected so that's sort of why it's done and without catching the entire colony and using some 409 kills white nose okay. but we can't just spray 409 over a bunch of bats we can't go into a cave and spray 409 because we're worried about killing the entire cave so mm -hmm. it, it's really difficult problem because they're carrying this disease with them and they're going to other caves and they're bouncing back and forth between bat populations and so it, it's it's a really difficult problem and we just ain't figured it out yet so it's kind of like the bat version of covid only we can't get them to wear their mask and Social Perfect. Distance. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. They're, they're, they don't have masks and they aren't very they aren't. good at keeping away from okay. each other. Well, I can relate to that. Yeah, too. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you bring these for us? I brought these books for you guys. I think there's 20 or so here. Um, That'd be great. Norma or whoever, yeah. Norma, will take possession of them and you guys can, whoever gets okay. the first 20. Thank you very right. much, Phil. I appreciate it. Thank you. See, now if we had our soundtrack, you'd just be getting rage with great reviews. <laughs> okay, right. next month, we're going to have uh, a, a treat. Vic and Sharon Krislipski are going to be doing a program for us, and the details will follow. It will be done in, in this venue as well, but we're trying to 
connect with, with some other possible options so that more people can come and see it in person. And are there any questions? Do we have anything we need to, to address here? Are we good for, the, good for the road? We had one more question from a, a potential viewer who said, when should we put birdhouses up? Well, I don't know about anybody else, but my bluebirds are acting like it's spring right now. I don't know what's going on. They're back at the boxes. So my suggestion would be put them up whenever you have them. Yeah, Keep much. them clean. We'll, uh, we'll, have a, we'll have our bluebird person talk to us in the spring about the, about the process of cleaning out the boxes. And also, we always need volunteers for our bluebird program, which was very successful this year. So with that, we are adjourned.